Thank you for joining us on another episode of Latter Gay Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Ashworth, and you are at the intersection of religion and sexuality, where it meets at the streets of LGBTQ Avenue and LDS Street. We want to thank you for giving us an hour of your time and welcome you to the podcast and welcome you to the 13th season of the Latter Day Stories podcast, providing queer stories into the uh, Latter Day Saint vernacular. And through that, and I guess from that evolution, 13 years ago, we finally uh, have arrived at the Latter Day Stories podcast, and you are sitting here uh, watching this video or listening to this audio podcast and experiencing the LGBTQ story firsthand, and I want to thank you for uh, participating. I think that's kind of a, an amazing accomplishment for a podcast that focuses on better understanding the LGBTQ experience to be here 13 years later and hundreds and hundreds of episodes later and stories uh, that have helped us to better understand what it's like um, in this community. So again, thank you. A little side note there, I just wanted to thank our audience. For those of you who have also helped us build the Latter Day Stories podcast, I wanted to say thank you to you as well. For those of you who are sharing our content, that is one of the greatest ways for us to build bigger and stronger bridges between the LDS and LGBTQ community. And that's by simply just mentioning, sharing, distributing an episode like this, whether it's on Facebook or YouTube, a simple share uh, or a click of the link uh, that subscribes yourself to this channel or commenting in your social circles about episodes like this. And for those of you who find uh, podcast episodes like this helpful, uh, sharing these episodes with others who are making this journey on their own as well. We invite you to use this as a resource to help other people better understand the LGBTQ experience. So with that aside, uh, and as always, I do want to say thank you for giving us an hour of your time to better understand another uh, experience and another story. I want to welcome to the Latter Gay Stories podcast, Braden, Braden Singley. Hello. Braden, welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. Congrats. I didn't know that it's been so long that you've done it for so many years. Yeah, this That's is great. our uh, 13th season. Sometimes people will measure their seasons in like half like fall, winter, or summer, spring. No, that's mm -hmm. like 13 real hard years of Jeez. this podcast being on the air. Mm, congrats. Amazing. Yeah, it is amazing. it is amazing. For me, it's exciting to um, be able to see and hear and understand these stories. And also, I, for those history nerds out there who love chronology and just seeing how things change, uh, listening to episodes um, in the very beginning, 13 years ago, compared to where they're at today, mm we see such uh, difference in the way even totally. the church relates to this topic and, and the church members. Mm -hmm. So I do think that we're doing some good and that we are making some difference. It's because of you and because of people like you, Braden, who are willing to share stories. Well, thank you. So for many of you, um, Braden may seem familiar. He might be a familiar <laughs> face if you are uh, one of the 22 and a half million uh. people that have seen your uh, TikTok video. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a lot of people. It's a lot of people. That's a lot of virality. It's that's an incredible amount of of um well, should we just back up for those who haven't seen your TikTok video? Um well, let's give them a little preview of of what they should see. This is uh Braden and his TikTok channel. Um your handle uh, BS is my BS are, BS my, are initials. my initials. Yeah. That's what it is. BS are my <laughs> initials. Yeah, Braden Singley, you know. I just discovered that I've been wrapping my towel around myself incorrectly for years because I usually take the excess and I tuck it towards myself like this and I'm around the kitchen doing some dishes, going for a jog and it falls down every time. But I thought, what if you tuck the excess underneath? You're invincible. Murder in the shower, run away. Still there. Jump over something. Still there. All right, now let's talk about what started, what <sighs> caused, what was the genesis behind I this mean, video. It was so basic and so not cool. I was swimming at my like good friend's pool one summer day, and I had like a plate of food in my hands and was trying to hold my towel on. And obviously it kept slipping and I was like, okay, this is not working. So I put my plate down and I was like, okay, how else can I do this? So then 
obviously I folded it and thought of just wrapping it the other way, grab my plate, my towel has sense to fall down. And so then I was like, why did nobody tell me about this? And then I thought, you know what? There's other people that probably need to hear this information. So then added some fun little jogging and running in place and yeah, kind of blew up. Well, it not only did it blow up, I mean, you, you changed celebrities' minds <laughs> on how to handle their towel uh, problems right. in and You're out of right. the shower. Like this went like worldwide, like it was, it was an explosion of, of oh, just like, oh, why didn't I think of that mixed with internet virality mixed with, um, there's this really handsome, hot looking guy, <laughs> uh, half clothed on my TikTok. So, <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, Drew Barrymore, she did like a little segment on her show, which was really fun. That was really exciting. Uh, I feel like a lot of the, why it went viral so quickly is because everyone in, um, like the Philippines and China were destroying me because they were like, oh, we've done this for years. And, you know, because some of their um, just clothing they wear, they wear something similar. Same in Africa. I think that's why it got so big so quickly is people were like, oh, yeah, we've done this for centuries. And I'm like, OK, that's great. But do I look cultured enough to have known <laughs> any of those things? You know, so, yeah, it was fun. It was fun. Well, we obviously didn't meet at the latter gay story studio to talk about how to fold your towel over you're your right, hip you're right you're right um there's far more to Braden's story than uh, viral TikTok videos and so i want to jump into your story you are a um former latter-day saint who was raised um, mormon went to byu mm -hmm. uh we're going to talk about a lot of deep topics um, concerning your childhood growing up what it's like to grow up um, being gay and trying to better understand who and what you are. We want to talk uh, a lot about what your experience was like um, coming out to your family, uh, serving a mission, uh, attending BYU, and what school life was like there, but also some of the hard topics. We want to talk about hookups. We want to talk about sexual oh, yeah. experiences. We want to yeah. talk about um, the taboo, the shame, the guilt that surrounds this topic often. Mm. So um, let's let the audience get to know Braden a little bit better. Okay. Uh, who are you? Where do you where'd you grow up? What's your family life like? And how does the beginning of the Braden story begin? Um, I'm from I grew up in Bountiful until I was about eight years old. And then we moved to Clearfield, Utah. So born and raised in Utah, lived in Utah my whole life. Uh, I have two siblings, an older brother and a younger sister. So there's three of us. And my parents have been separated for uh, ever since I was like a little kid, two or three years old. And my mom's been remarried a few times. Uh, so the majority of my life, I've been just raised by my mom, single mom, uh, who sacrificed so much so that we could do what we wanted and all the extracurricular activities. And I'm really thankful for her. Uh, she's very faithful. In her faith, she loves the church. And I feel like that's where a lot of my love for the church and the gospel and, and Christ came from was her, for sure. She was a great example to me. Still is. Uh, so that was like younger years. And we've lived in Clearfield since then. And my parents still live there now. So growing up, um, for many of us who grew up in the church, who also grew up hiding who and what we are, there was a constant battle trying to hide one and often uh, lift another. Mm. using religion as a springboard to help fix something that we, that we thought was broken within us. Did you experience that as well? <sighs> of course, of course. Um, yeah, just noticing that there was a part of me that was very different and was not only different but extremely wrong, but also at the same time trying not to focus on that so that I could give my attention and time to the church and to God, um, even though that part of me was so loud and begging for attention. And uh, it was something that I felt that I could never give it attention. And not only that, but to like shove it aside and, and to try to get rid of it entirely, which obviously didn't work. At what, at what age did you realize you were different? And how did that happen? How, how did you make those connections and realize that something about me is not 
similar to what my friends experience. Mm. I have a very vivid memory and it's funny that it's Christmas time because uh, there was one of the elf helpers in the Santa Claus movie that I thought was cute. Like it, he's a male actor. Uh, and I remember watching that movie and I, I remember thinking that he was cute. Uh, and then I saw Cheaper by the Dozen in theaters when I was about like eight years old. And I thought one of the other actors in that movie was cute as well. So those are the two little um, anchors that I used to go back to figure out how old I was. And I was about eight years old when I, when I recognized that nobody's talking, like no boys my age are talking about other boys that they think are cute. That just didn't exist. And so I would say it was around eight years old um, is where I've been able to pinpoint it. And then I remember, this is how I know that I remember that it, I was different, I felt different, was I was playing hide and go seek with some friends and we were oddly enough hiding in a closet, ironically. Uh, and I asked him, I remember asking him and being nervous to ask him, I said, do you think boys are cute? I remember asking him that that very specific question. I don't remember his response. I don't remember what he said, but I do remember vocalizing for the first time, asking somebody else if they thought boys were cute. Because obviously I would never have the need to do that if I fell into the pattern of, of everybody else of heterosexuality, right? I would never have to ask another guy if they think girls are cute. That just is what happens. So. I would say eight years old is when I kind of knew I was different. And then maybe a year or two later, I started to vocalize and ask around just because I did feel a difference. And what were those questions met with? As people, as you were asking those questions, probably all surrounding that very topic, mm -hmm. do you find other boys cute? Or is there a, a possibility for a connection like that? How, how do people respond to that? And particularly, I'm, cu I'm curious how your mom responded in this very orthodox religious mm. upbringing. So that was the only time I think I ever vocalized it uh, was as a kid. I don't think I ever brought it up to anybody until I was a teenager um, after I had asked that initial, my friend that initial question. So... I kept it pretty quiet and I didn't really ask any questions beside that one. At least that's the only one that I can remember. Church life. This is something that's familiar to many of us who grew up in Mormonism. Uh, the church is never over, overly favorable to this topic. Its policies and doctrines always um, erred on the side of uh, being homophobic, for lack of a better mm. term. Um, it was a very... Uh, the doctrine within Mormonism is very cisgender, um, in many cases very white, and very uh, patriarchally motivated. So uh, what was it like understanding that so much of the church's doctrine and policy was targeted against a part of you that you were trying to hide? <sighs> It was a lot, to say the least. Uh, it was still something that I was very much, I agreed with the church my whole life. I was on their side always. So I agreed with them. I agreed that this part of me was so evil that it was wrong that I should l give it no time or no attention and try to do everything that I could to make it go away. So I honestly was on their side growing up, I, I didn't um, push back or, or think differently because my thoughts were their thoughts, you know, growing up. And so honestly, I didn't really feel the need to oppose that in any way. Um, but the heaviness I felt knowing that it was always there eating at me, that's how I, I view it growing up, was really hard. I felt like no matter what the brethren were saying to me, no matter what they said, like to, to sing hymns and, and to the list of things that they tell us to do in order to have those feelings go away, nothing worked ever, ever. 
And it was really frustrating because I was like, listen, I'm trying. I want to do what you're telling me. I want to follow what you're saying, but um, it just never worked. And that, and that caused a lot of frustration because of I'm quite a perfectionist, which I feel like a lot of us are. Um, and so that was the one part about me that I felt like I was in with the church. I was with the brethren and I wanted to be perfect. And that was just the one tiny little thing that kept me from being the best member I could be. I'm curious because you opened that by saying that you were doing all the things uh, that you thought were necessary to fix this totally. part of you. What were some of the things that, that you were using to fix? I mean, what did it look like in your mind to fix this part of you? Um, anywhere from like climbing the ladder of getting the ironic priesthood and then working hard to be like deacons quorum president or, or holding the positions in the church, you know, as, as a young man. And, and I, which I did, you know, I, I thought that serving in those positions would at least take me out of myself and allow me to help others. And which I feel like I probably did, but, uh, definitely trying to just climb the, the ladder. I thought that would help. Um, reading my scriptures, obviously, just the primary answer is the praying, the reading the scriptures. I obviously served a mission, thought that would help. Uh, yeah. Before, Those are the big ones. before we hit the mission, um, let's talk about, we've, I think we've got a pretty good idea as to what life was like early on in the church, eight, mm -hmm. nine, 10, 11, 12. But then, Really, 12 is a pivotal moment for a lot of us gay kids because mm. puberty hits. And uh, you start, all kinds of things start functioning and moving and working. Uh, yep. Yep. Both Our little factories. The, thank you, Boyd K. <laughs> Packer. Yeah. The, the little factory <laughs> kicks in. Um, the hormones are, are moving at an all-time speed. Uh, mm. And we start developing crushes, and we start developing these... Um, desires for companionship or at least uh, the opportunity to be with somebody. Um, mm -hmm. Tell us about high school and when, when the, f we don't necessarily have to talk about when the factory began <laughs> um, producing <laughs> steam, uh, but, but how did you manage that? Like, how did you, how did you navigate that world? I feel like this is where all of my guilt comes into play. Up until now, I, I just had a, a realization that I was different and that <clears throat> I would follow what the brethren said. But it wasn't until puberty hit and I started having like sexual desires that this is where everything comes crumbling down. Because before this, I just thought boys were cute. You know, that was the only verbiage I had to describe my feelings towards them was just them being cute. It's innocent. Your brain can't really think of anything different other than that. So when I did start having um, sexual desires and sexual attraction to men or, or kids my age, this is where all of the shame and the guilt just started piling on because then masturbation become comes into play and pornography usually comes into play and and obviously the church's messaging on those topics are just avoidant entirely um, and they used to be very aggressive which I'm sure you're aware and I feel like the narrative has changed greatly over the past few years which I'm very grateful for um, but growing up as a teenager uh, I'll start in junior high because I feel like that's where uh, things started getting very hard. I felt like everybody in my school knew about my sexuality more than I did. They all had claimed to know me and, and know that I was gay and, and just started throwing like labels on top of me, which was really hard because obviously I knew they were right inside. And so every single day I went to school, I felt like I was on defense all the, all the time. I was always on defense and I lied every single day. I had to lie, which if you know me, I'm, I tried to be as honest as possible. So it, it created a lot of um, pressure inside of me because every single day I went to school, I had to lie. It would, my sexuality would be brought up 
somehow, some way, and I would have to tell somebody that, like, no, I'm not into guys, or, oh, yeah, I think this girl's really cute, or um, I just had to lie a lot, which was really hurtful to me. Um, and then outside of junior high, uh, high school was pretty great. Um, I did theater in junior high school, uh, which obviously didn't help my cause of trying to hide my homosexuality. <laughs> and I was a, a very well put together kid. I cared about my appearance and growing up with a single mom, like, sh you know, we don't have the typical masculine figure in my household. And so, uh, I cared about my appearance and I cared about my language and I, I followed the whole preppy, you know, trying to get straight A's and I didn't follow the typical masculine uh, pattern. So obviously I just had a target on my back. Uh, but in high school, I felt like I was able to shed that a little bit because I found groups of friends that were very loving um, and there were women that I found attractive enough that I dated. So I, I've had girlfriends in the past, which was helpful. Um, but again, nothing, nothing seemed to work. I came face to face with my homosexuality at the end of the day, every single day, which was really tricky. Oh, I think putting all the cards on the table, I mean, you, you brought up uh, porn and masturbation. Was that something that integrated into your system based on a coping mechanism, ba on a way to mm -hmm. validate who you are after spending days and days and days defending against what the world knew of you or mm -hmm. thought of you? And was that, was that an opportunity for you to finally feel a connection with yourself I'm just curious mm. like I, I don't know that there, there's obviously not a wrong answer I'm just curious yeah. how how you perceive that because you also talked about that um which is familiar with so many Latter-day Saints with totally. guilt and shame mm. and and so how this is some dual-edged sword that slices us either way absolutely that's a really good question <clears throat> I Initially, no, I don't think it had anything to do with like me seeking connection or, or seeking to express myself in the way that I felt I needed to. It was just my attraction. That's what I was drawn to. I was drawn to men. So that was the type of, um, those were the visuals I used. Um, I don't know how explicit, I'd, I, I'll just, I'll, I'll just talk and then you tell me when to stop or tell me what not to bring up. But yeah, like when I would masturbate, I would envision doing things with men. It, it was never women. When I started looking at pornography, it had all to do with men and nothing to do with women. And so honestly, I think those, I was just fulfilling my desires. I don't, I don't necessarily know if it had anything to do with me trying to connect with parts of myself that I had to keep hidden. Um, that was just my reality. Those were just the, the types of things that were arousing to me. So it's safe to say, like many other Latter-day Saints in your situation, it was like using those coping mechanisms were part of the process. And, mm -hmm. and I think, you know, as we opened this episode, we talked about uh, Mormonism and, and other religions as well, uh, being so effective at creating taboo topics. And sexuality mm -hmm. is usually always one of them. And when we talk about sexuality, when we talk about um, methods by which we explore and better understand those parts of us, mm -hmm. especially within Mormon culture, we just don't talk about them. They're, they're so taboo that um, really the method is to bury them. Totally. And not totally. talk about them at all. Yes, yes. I, which I don't understand because it is such a universal thing that everybody thinks about, does all the time. Like, l it's not just like this little thing that only a few people think about or, or do. Somebody's sexuality and the way that they explore that and portray their sexuality is everything. It, it, it is one of the lenses that we view the world through. And it's so sad to me that religions and institutions are so harsh about a very common and normal practice 
that we all, like you just said, that we all experience. I don't understand it. it it's frustrating to me. So um, this was this was part of your journey as you were kind of going through high school. Um, mm -hmm. Typically for Latter-day Saints who reach that ripe old age of 18, 17, 18, you're graduating high school, the next step is preparation for a mission. Yeah. A lot of what we the things that we've been talking about for the last couple of minutes are so anti-mission in terms of the way mm. uh, Latter-day Saint leaders um, qualify its Mormon missionaries mm. for service. Mm. So I think we have a multiple thronged one, two, three, four, five, six, seven uh, angle punch here. You're gay. You're hiding it. Um, you, as you self-described, are so honest it's to your fault yeah. that you are living a lie that's eating at you. Totally. And you're using everyday experiences to hide um, and not be fully authentic or honest. Mm -hmm. Family, uh, pornography, uh, all of these things are things that are impacting your ability to be found worthy as mm. a missionary. I want to talk about that experience in preparation for your mission and specifically what you disclosed to church leaders, if anything, regarding your sexuality and these experiences that were haunting you. Oh, man, what a topic. I didn't share my sexuality with any of my church leaders, to my recollection. I did talk about, obviously they ask when you're preparing and receiving the priesthood about pornography usage and masturbation. So that was brought up, definitely. And it was always just kind of like quickly moved on from, but I never talked about my sexuality really. Um, I, I didn't tell them what pornography I was viewing. Uh, it was always just that I was doing it, and then it would be the typical, like, okay, just tr try not to do it and move on from that. Um, but as far as, like, the amount of pressure I put on myself, I feel like was way stronger than any pressure I received from any leader. I wanted to be perfect before I served a mission. I wanted to go without masturbating ever, go without seeing pornography ever. Um, and also, disclaimer, when I'm talking about these things, I feel like it, it can sound as if, if I say, oh yeah, I, I can talk about masturbation and pornography. That doesn't mean that it's like in excess or often, but growing up in the church, if you like masturbate once or twice a month, you are addicted. Right, I feel like it's the the extremity of, it's so taboo that, and so bad that if you do it once or twice, you are taught to believe that, oh no, you are spiraling downhill and you're out of control. So while I'm bringing these things up, I mean, I was what, masturbating maybe once or twice a week. And that pressure alone was so terrifying to me that as a missionary, if I didn't cut this out, then... How could I help people? How could I like sit in front of them and talk about how beautiful the gospel is and what God wants them to do? And then I go home and then I'm like doing these inappropriate things or whatever. So I wanted to make sure that I was like porn free, masturbation free um, before I started a mission. I think that's really honest. And I think that is uh, it's an experience that's familiar with so many mm -hmm. Latter-day Saints um, who who fight this, and I air quote this battle, because I think this is Ugh. way too often a, um, a self-sabotage battle. This oh my is, gosh. This is, a, yes. this is a problem that was created yes. um, as an opportunity to maybe wrangle and keep hold of the saints. Absolutely. And, and I don't think that was the church's intent or any other religion for that, for that um, fact, but they genuinely believe the things that they teach. And I don't think it's to like silence us or they genuinely believe that those things are bad. And so they teach that they are bad. So I think some of the responsibility falls on us and the culture we create as a church on how extreme we tackle what the brethren teach. And yeah, sadly, one of those things is such a common biological, biological process. 
and I think you I think you nailed it really well when you talked about um, the Boyd K. Packer experience. The um, to young men only is where the little factory talk came mm-hmm. in, and yeah. this was the churches in, in my study of church history really the first time that they really jumped um, onto this horse of uh, uh, the uh, exposing and trying to better understand or at least put uh, a focus on masturbation mm. and how that mm. led, uh, as Boyd K. Packer said, specifically to homosexuality. If, if yes. you allowed that to happen, um, that was one of the avenues that could happen. So there was <laughs> this fear that was created. And I think you're right. Like <sighs> there, I don't, I generally think a lot of Latter-day Saint local leaders, like our bishops, our state presidents, our branch presidents, mm-hmm. young men leaders, they They've ridden this horse. They've been down this trail. Of course, they, of course. They know um, that everyone does it. Yeah. And so there's a little less shame there. But there are pockets of um, leaders, some stake presidents, some bishops, who take this to the extreme mm. and and just overdo their desire to push this narrative. And mm. so um, not that we have to jump down that uh, road, the, the whole podcast episode, but I, I think it was important to highlight how that made an impact on your life. Absolutely. And, and sometimes the impact isn't always positive. Um, no. I, I'm a firm believer in everyone trying to do better um, and trying to be the very best selves they can be. But I'm also a firm believer in having people live to the fullest measure of their creation. And Totally. And when we try to silence something like you talked about being biologically and naturally common and normal, that's one area that I think Mormonism struggles with, and we can definitely do better. But you did serve. You ended up being called um, to serve mm-hmm. a mission in mm-hmm. uh, Washington. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about what it's like being a closeted gay Mormon missionary, um, <laughs> serving, living with, and interacting with other men on a totally. 24-hour basis. Yeah. Um, but again, I'm, I'm guessing still fighting these battles that were familiar in your high school years. Yeah. Yeah. Um. With the kind of black and white glasses I had on my whole life, I knew that when when or if I served a mission, I would not masturbate. I would put all of that aside, and I would not think about anything sexual for those two years. And I did, and I feel very accomplished for that. I still will hold that as a trophy of mine. (laughs) Um, And I honestly think on my mission, a lot of my... uh, intense attractions and all of that kind of dissipated. They weren't gone. They weren't gone. Um, But they were way more quiet. And I think it's just because I had such a strong mindset that if I was going to be a missionary, I was going to be like the best missionary possible. And so everything that, every thought that went through my brain was about missionary work, was about the people we were teaching. So honestly, there was just no time for any other thoughts. There was no time for me to think about my hobbies or dancing or so there definitely wasn't time to be thinking about sexuality because I just filled my brain on purpose with anything else that I could think of. Well, I think Mormonism does, especially when we talk about missions, the church does a really great job at framing missions as opportunities to lose yourself in the work. Totally. The, totally. the whole of Doctrine and Covenants 4 is just putting forth your a whole might, might, mind, and strength mm-hmm. in the service and losing yourself in the service. And, and I think there's some effective uh, patterns of behavior that come out of that in terms totally. of, of our ability to hide um, and put away, or if it's, we're talking about theater, the Book of Mormon musical, like <laughs> put this into a box yeah. and crush it. Because um, yeah. that, that really does exist when you serve a mission with that mindset. Totally. And so often what I find when we have these discussions is that we become uh, ultra-Orthodox missionaries. Oh, my gosh. You obey every (sighs) rule to the nth degree. And it looks like, (laughs) judging on your reactions, that you were one of those missionaries. Of course I was one of those missionaries. Um, Not my whole mission. I would say the first... The first like month or so, I tried to be as much myself as possible. And then it's a culture. It's a very strong culture for my friends out there that have served a mission. Mission cultures, I mean, they have their own way of speaking. They have their own accent, like a missionary accent. It's so strong. And so 
I, of course, fell into the culture of being extreme. And uh, I'm, I know I said or did things to like other missionaries, like as when I was a leader, that were probably harmful and or hurtful just out of my own like insecurities and this is not a uh, rarity I feel like many missionaries fall into the same pattern of trying to be as perfect as they can and I call it like pharisaical which is very funny because you're on a mission to serve Christ and be like Christ but somehow we all turn into like little pharisees um following and, and being obsessed with your own obedience instead of just being obsessed with loving people and sitting with them and hearing them out. And I wish so badly I obviously could go back and, well, whoa, I don't want to go. I don't want to do that ever again. <laughs> very positive, and I had a very positive mission. But there are definitely things that I would have approached differently. Um, I was very extreme. And when I came home from my mission, kept that... Um, extremity and was said hurtful things to my friends or family and uh, and now here we are on the other side very very opposite of what I used to be before we talk about the other side of this aisle I do want to touch on something you did bring up about um, uh, maybe two things uh, were you disappointed you, you brought up that a lot of us missionaries, gay or straight, mm-hmm. um, want to serve missions with this intent. And I think the missions are framed this way, to help us overcome the natural man and help us mm. to become better people. Uh, and often, I am guilty of this as well, I served a mission knowing that um, it was just part of that process, that fixing process, that, yeah. that was my promise to God. If I gave you everything, you were mm. going to fix me and change this part of me that Jeez. I wanted to change. And you clearly had spent an enormous amount of effort overcoming some natural habits. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you were free and void of those throughout your whole mission. Was there any part when you did step off that airplane back in Utah, when you come home, um, you looked over your mission experience and said, oh, huh, still gay. I <sighs> am not fixed but I, I still gave everything. And was there a disappointing moment uh, in that reflection? I think that, <clears throat> that realization that you just brought up is so powerful. The moment where you thought things were fixed and then again, you're backed up against the wall, you're forced to face it once again and to go, oh, okay, it, nothing changed. It's still here. (sighs) Yeah, very disappointing. Very disappointing because I thought it had gone away. I thought it had mostly gone away. I remember knocking on a door and uh, and like this um, sister answered probably around 20s or something and I thought she was beautiful and I was attracted to her. And at that moment as a missionary, I was like, this is it. Maybe like maybe things are changing. Like I'm attracted to this female that answered the door. Uh, and so there were moments that kind of made me believe that it, it had vanished. <sighs> um, but upon coming home, and what, the two or three months I went still not masturbating or watching porn, obviously I, I kind of broke down again and, and started those habits. They, it was as if nothing had changed. It was back to the way it was. And yeah, it was frustrating. It was very frustrating. And clearly the remedy to this, if you have served a mission and walked off that airplane and still realized that you were gay as a firefly and <laughs> nothing had been fixed. Uh, the only uh, remedy is uh, establishing yourself at the Lord's University. It is oh. now step two, and it's time <laughs> to not. enroll in, in, at BYU. I'm guessing this was Braden's journey. Yeah. Uh, you know, on a mission, you set all of these goals. It, it was called My Plan. I don't know if they still have it. Uh, uh, Come Follow Me had just was literally released the year like halfway through my mission. So um, we oh, didn't have any of those. We and, Okay, okay, okay. I mean, I'm, I'm an old missionary. No, I, yeah, I yeah. served and came home. I was 2001 to 2003, so. Oh, great. Yeah, it was for That's when I watched Cheaper by the Dozen. <laughs> That's when I had my little gay awakening. <laughs> you were eight. I was serving my mission. <laughs> um, yeah, so there was this uh, program called My Plan. It has you set goals, like how many times you're going to go to the temple and uh, – 
it has you uh, send your records to where you are moving to make sure that the YSA ward knows where you are and can take care of you. And, and I was like, okay, I'm going to go to BYU. Like, love the church, love the, the opportunities there. Um, and I was convinced I could find a wife. That if, if I could make it work with a woman, that she would be within the walls of BYU. I felt that very strongly, very strongly. I told that to many people, that I was like, oh, I can't wait to go to BYU because there's so many people uh, I think I said girls, obviously. I was like, oh, there's so many girls there, and they're all r righteous and, and following the gospel, and they want what I want. And so I feel like the pool of opportunity is just larger at BYU. <sighs> um, so I, I genuinely was convinced that I, I could get rid of these feelings by finding a woman that I was attracted to enough, uh, that was good enough that... Um, I could set those aside and she would be within the walls of BYU. I was convinced, convinced that that was going to happen. And did it? Did you date it? Did you date at BYU? No, oh. it did not happen. <laughs> no MRS or MR degree? <laughs> no, my hand is bare. Uh, of, of course it didn't happen. Um, and it does for some people. I, I probably should have said this at the beginning that I want to can I want to speak solely on my behalf, and this is my experience. And just because this is my experience doesn't mean that somebody else can take a complete opposite, you know, direction and and live a very happy life. So, this is all just kind of my my own personal experience with it. I tried dating. I went on two dates, two uh, not Hinge, uh, Mutual. I downloaded Mutual, um, and I went on two different dates with two different women. And it was on one of those dates where we went and got ice cream at Macy's, which is, you know, the thing, one of the things to do. And I remember sitting there just like asking her questions. And I was like, I'm basically interviewing you. And I was like, I don't, I don't think this is what dating should be like. And I had realized that these two women that I had gone on dates with, I was looking for them to save me. I didn't care about them, them, like as deeply as I probably should. It was more of, are you a woman that can save me? Like, are you the woman that can fix this part of me? And I felt terrible after that date. And I was like, okay, I'm not going to date again until I know that my intentions are pure and that I could give somebody myself and love instead of just like want... Um, a saving grace. So that was tricky. The curriculum, um, I want to talk about what it's like to be gay at BYU and closeted. Um, the curriculum isn't geared towards um, anything other than heterosexuality yeah. and building a family and, and, and getting married and growing your little family and, mm -hmm. and living as righteously as possible. With that mindset, um, knowing that the church's history also included the admonition to enter into mixed orientation marriages, using mm -hmm. um, marriage as a remedy to sexuality. Did you run into any of those dichotomies? Did you run into, um, obviously you're dating um, a couple times and realized, I mean, right up front, there's that brick wall. Yeah. Um, were the church's teachings effective to you as a, as a BYU student <laughs> in helping you to become a more heterosexual Latter-day Saint? I mean, there's a lot of effort that's put into Jeez. those programs. I'm just wondering how effective they were for you. <sighs> to be honest, I don't think they... It was more of the culture of the students that made me, like, very driven to find a woman. It wasn't as much um, the teachings that I was receiving. It was mainly just, like, everything was always about dating and everything was always about who's seeing who and if you're going to make out and if you're going to hot tub. So I feel like my own experience, it came less from the instruction and definitely more from just the culture of the university, as most colleges are very, very driven on dating. But BYU is different in the fact that everybody's looking to marry, obviously, and that's part of the church as well. So 
Yeah, more of the culture. Did you ever have any interaction with other queer students at BYU? Did you ever seek them out? Did you were you aware or familiar with with queer groups? I know they didn't exist on campus, but there were a, a, a few groups that sat outside of the walls of BYU. Yeah, I. So I, you know, I was very closeted at BYU. Uh, not closed off, I will say. I feel like I was starting to open myself up a little bit. I just wasn't vocal about how I felt um, about men. So I'm sure there were like groups and, and people that were doing a lot of good. I just wasn't aware of them because I just kept my eyes closed basically and was plowing through school. But I was a dance major and I was surrounded by um, people in the MDT program, the musical theater program. And so, yeah, I was, I had interactions with queer people all the time uh, in the dance department. And the universe, and the professors, they are, are incredible. They are, they are so loving and so open and accepting and, you know, dancing, liberal arts tends to just be uh, more geared toward acceptance and freedom and all those things. So if anything, that was the safest place for me to be at BYU was surrounded by professors and students that were similar to me, even though I didn't vocally tell them that I was similar to them. We, I, I can see that there's probably some holy envy here. Um, being able to witness, especially in the, the music dance theater program, uh, interaction with other schools and seeing gay couples, ge seeing gay people mm. Um, mm. in the wild um, and in <laughs> yeah. your periphery. Was yeah. there any holy envy there? Because at some point, very, very soon, it's at BYU that you finally do come out. So there had to have, I'm, I'm curious about uh, what led up to those experiences where, where Braden finally had an Abrahamic experience and, mm. and Braden had to learn something about Braden, so much so that it caused you to come out. What led up to that? Yeah, it had nothing to do with um, seeing other other people at like other schools being able to live their lives because I still wanted to be closeted. I didn't want to be with a man. So even when I would see that in in the wild per se, uh, I still that was something I didn't want. So that that wasn't really it. I'll tell you what it was. I like that you said an Abrahamic moment because it was it was very impactful for me. <sighs> I took a spring semester in um, two thousand nineteen. It was the second to last semester of my college years at BYU. And I took a philosophy class. And that philosophy class is what tipped the scale to help me start accepting and coming face to face in a loving way with my sexuality. And I am so grateful. I am so grateful for my professor and just his curriculum and what it taught me and he had us like going and meditating with like Buddhist groups. And he, th there was always like one activity that we had to go do outside of the church and outside of the realm of everything to experience the world. And it was in those experiences that uh, I came to the realization that I needed to treat my homosexuality like a child, like a screaming child that's begging for help. And instead of pushing it away, because, you know, if you're taking care of, of a baby that's screaming, giving it less attention makes it scream louder. And I learned that that was what was happening with my sexuality. And so through a lot of prayer, a lot of temple attendance in this spring semester and with this philosophy class, I was like, okay, I'm going to take this child of mine and hold it close to me and just say, okay, I see you. What do you need from me? Instead of pushing you aside, instead of not taking care of you, instead of starving you, I, I remember a prayer I asked God. I said, God, I have done everything I know how, everything to change myself, to take away my, my homosexuality. Nothing is working. You know how hard I've tried. What else is there to do? And in my, in my brain, in my feelings, I, I felt God respond, him saying like, well, there's one thing you haven't done, and that's to let it happen. And I was like, what? No, you can't like give me permission. That doesn't make sense. Like That didn't make sense in my brain. And then I was like, okay, I'm going to try it, and we'll see how it goes. And so 
I just started opening up bit by bit. And whenever I had thoughts or feelings, I just let them happen. And I gave them the attention they needed. The first thing I did, I still remember it. There's a Brazilian restaurant. I don't know if it's still there in Provo on, uh, is it Main Street? I don't know what streets are in Provo. Um, and the waiter that helped me was beautiful. And I thought he was attractive. And so once I was done with my meal, I had my philosophy uh, worksheet, actually, and I ripped off a little corner piece, and I said, hey, you seem like a great guy. If you want to hang out, here's my number. And that was the very first thing that I had done, and instead of like having the thought like, oh, he's really cute, you should like try to connect with him, instead of just like throwing that aside and being like, no, stop like finish your meal, get up and leave. I was like, okay, this is what you want right now. I'm going to give it to you. So I did. Oh my gosh. I left that. I left that restaurant just like on cloud nine, knowing he was probably straight and I would never hear from them, from him. Uh, but I, I did it. I did something scary and I did something that felt in the deepest part of me, right. And that's when I started um, taking care of my sexuality. And he never called? Oh, of course not. Of course not. No. But again, it, it was more the experience and the first step in what would lead to me coming out to my family. And let's talk about that. I, I, want, I want to understand what that coming out experience looked like, what led up to it, and uh, the reactions from you and those involved. <sighs> Um, coming out, I did it bit by bit. I had gone to the temple and I was like, okay, God, I, I want to start dating men. Let's just try it. And so God, what I felt him say was like, okay, keep these boundaries, you know, stay in this little box. Don't do anything sexual. Keep everything spiritual and, and lighthearted. And I'll give you the green light to start dating. And so once I received that, there was this kid on Instagram that I talked back and forth with, and he was the first person I went on a date with. And so I remember telling my mom that I had a date with a boy, and that was it. That was it. That's all I kind of said. Um, because rewind, my mom had found like gay pornography on our uh, search history on our computer, right? Because what parent isn't checking the history? Of yeah, and clearly it was your sister that was. Oh, doing of that. course. <laughs> no, my sister's perfect. She would never. Uh, and so, obviously, they they my parents have known known uh, since I was younger, but that was when it was like confirmed to them that I had sexual feelings and attractions to men. So my mom and I had always talked about, bit by bit, just these feelings. I would always talk about these feelings that I have, or, and I would always allude to them in a very, very vague way. And so this wasn't surprising to my mom. My mom and I have always had an extremely open relationship, always. She knows everything about me, um, and I'm really thankful for that. And it made the whole coming out process so much easier. Um, so I told her that I was going on a date. We went on the date, and it was fine. And when I drove up to pick him up at whatever apartment complex it was, I could feel my heart pounding, like, in my throat. It was, I, I was so scared, and I was so nervous. And we got uh, Chick-fil-A, and then we drove up, um, what's it called, Alpine Loop? Yeah. Alpine Loop, and then we went through, like, a little Halloween display drive through thing. It was in October. This was October of 2019. Uh, and it was a great time. It was a great time, but I was like, okay, yeah, that was fun and really exciting, but I don't think that was, that was it by any means. Um, and so once I graduated from BYU, I flew to Israel a few days later to audition for um, a dance company out there. It's called Batsheva. They're incredible. Um, and so I was invited to go audition for them. And so while I was out of the country, I downloaded Tinder. Uh, and I was talking to guys in Israel because it was safe. Nobody could see me. And 
I ended up meeting a mutual friend through Instagram, not Tinder. The Tinder is going to be important in the future. Uh, and I had my first kiss with a boy in Israel. And I went to Jerusalem the next day, <laughs> which was <laughs> a lot to sift through. Um, we can come back to this in a second. But then when I got home in January of 2020, January of 2020, I decided to leave my Tinder on in the States and in Utah. I had never left it on in the state of Utah. And so I left it on for the first time and then decided uh, to start dating men officially, to start actively trying to date men instead of women. So that was big. Uh, you were, so January 2020, graduated from BYU. You're, yes. You're out of BYU. Yes. So there's probably a little freedom there. Like, uh, not, totally. being, not being bound by the honor code gave you an opportunity to explore. Yeah. Uh, I would also assume that given the positive reaction that your mother gave, that was also a little bit of a green light. Totally. And then you also, you started the sharing this experience with your personal experience with deity. Like you mm. felt like God gave you the parameters. Totally. Um, that here are the, the four corners that are mm. appropriate uh, and stay within those and see how it goes. Yeah. Um, and from the Alpine loop to the Israeli kiss, <laughs> uh, it sounds like things had, quite the jump, isn't it? had moved uh, quite quickly. <laughs> Well, everything moves quick, I feel like, in the queer community. I feel like everything is on hyperdrive. That's true. Right, because we're all, we're all contained in this pressure cooker. And so once the pressure cooker blows up and you can't take it anymore, everything is, is just fast and extreme. So Yeah, we joke about that, but what you're actually bringing up is a very valid and um, real experience for so many uh, totally. Not only just Latter Day Saints, but so many closeted queer kids who do finally have this experience. And we talked about this a little bit off air. The uh, this experience is real for uh, Latter Day Saints who are raised in this uh, ultra orthodox religion. Mm. Uh, we were never taught how to date. We were never taught how to queer date. Uh, there was never a steak dance where we were welcome to hold hands with another boy. And so it's usually often after missions, after church school experiences after you step away from religion just a little bit, that you finally get the nerve to actually begin dating for the first time. Totally. And to actually be a teenager. Yes. And you're usually in your 20s or 30s. Absolutely. And so, so much wasted bandwidth and, and so much lost opportunity. Yeah. Um, innocence lost, essentially. Mm. For so many of us, it also leads into, um, very candidly, what I've called the whore phase. And mm. this opportunity to jump, like you said, like where people just jump both feet, feet first, yes. or dive right into the rocks. Yes. Um, did you experience that also? Uh, and what was that like uh, to navigate that world? <clears throat> so yes, I experienced that for sure. Uh, and I, I've i shared some of the experiences I, I feel like I can share on, on Facebook. There was Last June, I did, um, for Pride Month, every day I kind of posted just like a, a queer experience I've, I've had growing up. And that was the first time I kind of opened up about being sexually active for the first time to people that have been following my life and my journey. Uh, so that helped me become more comfortable talking about it. And since then, I feel like I'm, I've tried to be as open as possible talking about the whore phase, if you will. Um, and you're right, we, I, I have so many thoughts on this, and, and you touched on it about how as a gay person being raised in the church, we, or just in general, we get to watch everyone around us take baby steps in their sexuality. They get to have crushes, then they get to hold hands, then they get to kiss, and then they get to go too far a little bit, make out a little too hot and heavy and then they get to pull back a little bit and they and they get to learn boundaries little by little and they can talk to their parents about it and and they have leaders that talk about like hey oh yeah like I made out with girls all the time and you know they get validation and they get to progress bit by bit in their sexuality whereas 
growing up gay in the church, I had nobody to talk to about anything. At least it felt that way. So instead of going bit by bit in the swimming pool to the deep end and learning how to swim with like people helping you along and showing you how to do it, you waltz your way up to the top of a, a really high dive and you just jump in. And the other way I see it is a pendulum that the pendulum has stayed over on the extreme religious, don't do anything, don't think about anything sexual, it's all bad, it's all bad. The second you let that go, that much gravity is going to take it to the other side. And you're going to keep doing this, going back and forth, until you find a balance in the middle. And that's been my experience, very common experience, as I'm sure you've experienced either yourself or just with people that you've talked to you go from one extreme to the other extreme. And uh, Grinder. I don't know, have you talked about Grinder on here before? Some of my, uh, and this is being super candid, some of my most popular episodes are those where people just like bear it all. Great, and, let's talk about and it. And the reason isn't because <laughs> I, I don't think that people are interested in the nitty gritty, but no. it, this is familiar territory and Very we don't common. talk about it. Yes, and people don't talk about it. And, and I'm like, listen, don't log on. Well, I can't tell you what to do or what not to do. Um, there's an app called Grinder for my friends that are not familiar. And if I wanted to, I could download the app. It's a hookup app, right? Um, I could download it and go have a sexual experience with somebody in 20 minutes, like a stranger, a complete stranger. When it's that easy and that accessible to like young people that have never had the opportunity to set boundaries for themselves growing up, we all just jump and we go for it. And we just, and sometimes people find themselves in dangerous situations. They find themselves um, contracting diseases that they, they could have avoided if they knew a little bit more about the, um, the details about sexuality and having been sexually active. And, that just doesn't exist. It doesn't ex exist in the church for heterosexual people, so it definitely doesn't exist for uh, gay members of the church growing up that were raised in the church. And so, yeah, I've definitely had a horror phase, and I don't care sharing it. It's reality. I'm not going to spin it and act as if my life is different than it is. I lived too many years doing that. I'm done with that. I want everybody to know, if they want to know what's going on. I'm so... I. I'm so tired of lying and I, of lying my whole life that yeah, I want to talk about it. I want to talk about the dangers behind it. I want to talk about the positive experiences that you can have with it and, and the friends that you can make um, connecting on a different level other than just emotionally. It's Being sexually active has brought to me so many important, okay, I wouldn't say so many, some very important people in my life. It's also led me to um, maybe stay in relationships that I probably shouldn't have been. Um, so it's like a catch-22. On The Office, there's a moment where uh, one of the characters talks about coming out, and he goes, it does, in fact, get better, but it also gets vastly more complicated. And that's how I feel being sexually active is as well, that... It's like anything else, you have to learn boundaries, you have to learn preferences, you have to learn um, safety. And I feel like more people can be talking about it openly. I remember listening to many podcasts coming out, trying to come out and, and everybody would talk about dating and everybody would talk about their um, spirituality, but nobody would get just into the day-to-day -day details of what it is like to have so much sexual tension built up and, and what it looks like to act on that and what it looks like to not act on it. And I felt like nobody was talking about it and unless it was in these really close circles of friends. And so for young queer people, gay people in the church, I keep saying gay, I wanna specify because I don't know what it's like in the trans community and I can't speak on anybody else other than my own lived experience, which is being gay. Um, young gay people are looking for answers and they're not getting them and I want to have resources for them 
if they choose to be sexually active. I'm not saying go do whatever you want and, and just whatever. It, but if you are choosing to be sexually active, especially during this horror phase at the beginning, and you don't have to go through a horror phase, right? That There's a lot of people that I've talked to that, you know, that's not a must for everybody, but it is extremely common. And I want young, especially young gays coming out, I want them to have resources and I want them to have people to talk to. I think that's, I think that's super wise advice. And we're having an honest conversation about a really difficult topic to discuss yeah. because uh, there are, I agree, there are a few resources. Um, if you were to look back to 21 year old Brayden, um, what advice would you give? Um, in terms of what you did learn and what you should have learned um, in terms of better sexual health. What advice do you give someone who's listening to this episode that is now staring at their phone saying, should I download, download Grindr? Or uh, is, that, is that the path really for me, knowing uh, what we've talked about being true? There, wa there weren't, we wasted a lot of bandwidth um, mm. and there weren't a lot of resources to help us get to this point where we can uh, navigate this world in a healthy way. So how do we fast forward what we didn't get, but yet mm. still maintain the navigational beacons in a healthy way? Man, what a good question. I hesitate giving blanket advice just because everybody's situation is so different. One word of advice that I would say is surround yourself with people that are okay with you talking about being sexually active, if that's something you want to do. Be okay, like have friends that are okay with you talking about going and hooking up with somebody. Be okay that are going to be okay and have your back and make sure that you're doing safe things. So I'm not gonna tell you what to do or not to do as far as like Grindr or any of the other apps or, or how to address it, but that in my life has helped me the most is to have people, friends, like I have close, um, friends that I've been able to talk about these things with. And that takes a lot of the, the taboo-ness and it takes a lot of the shame and guilt away from it when you can just talk through your thoughts and feelings with your friends. So I would just say, surround yourself with some people you can trust before you start delving into being sexually active. Because if you're doing it alone, chances are you're going to run into a lot of situations that are hard to get out of without um, supportive people. I, I like that you bring up supportive people because I'm curious where your family is at um, <laughs> through this whole uh, journey. <laughs> yeah, um, good question. As Because I'm sure they're seeing and noticing changes. You brought up your Facebook post. Uh, yeah. I do remember reading that uh, during Pride Month and just smiling and just like this little bit of accomplishment seeing mm. a new little baby gay get their wings uh, is kind of how when i read your your <laughs> facebook post and a couple of years ago i just thought this is this is honest and this is the experience of of a gay person and uh, how as you navigated that journey there were plenty of bumps and bruises but also um opportunities to take some selfies on top of the mountain because you survived mm. and and you won so yeah, where were your where was your family in all of this? Because clearly they they're recognizing a changing Braden. They're yeah. recognizing things that are happening differently for you, and I'm curious how they react to that. If it were if it was positive, negative, or, and how that reaction benefited you, or impacted you. Totally, I would say overall very positive. I I am very I'm really grateful for my family specifically. I have a I have a really good relationship with them. So they have been, if not like out, outwardly, vocally supportive, they have always listened to me. They have always been there for me. The first thing that my sister said to me when I told her I was going to start dating men, she said, okay, just be careful with your heart. Like that's what she cared about. That's, she just didn't want to see me get hurt, you know. And that's the type of relationship I have with my brother and my sister and my mom. Uh it's taken a lot of effort on my part, I will say, because I, I bring up really difficult things to talk about. Uh, I've had to bring up, I mean, I've, I've had boyfriends 
I've gone and stayed over at their houses. I, I've, I've just been very clear with my mom. If I go and get tested, which I think we should talk about at some point, um, going and getting tested for like STIs or getting my blood work done or, or, or something like that. I, I'm just open about it. I'm vocally open about that. And I try to respect where they are at. So I try to do it with caution and with um, just respect. So I think that has helped our relationship stay stable as I've been um, exploring some extremes in the past. So, yeah, yeah. You, I think you bring up um, another great point. I, I'm just, I'm correlating your experience with my own and, mm. and at the same time, like thinking, oh my gosh, if I would have had this opportunity to also have a candid conversation, where would my life have, my path taken me? Mm. Um, as you kind of discuss all of these things, the, the first thing I thought of, or as you're discussing these things, the things that I'm continuing to think of, are um, these are stepping stones in preparation for what? Like, mm. as I listen to you tell these experiences, and even the mm. hookup culture, the, the whore phase, um, the testing, which I'm 100% on board for talking about, they all finally led me to a spot. Um, it, those all were stepping stones to get me to a place. For you, where did all of these experiences take you, or where do you hope they take mm. you um, mm. at this point in your life? Ultimately, I hope they just round me out to be a better person so that in the future, if or when I meet somebody uh, that I choose to spend the rest of my life with, I can give them every part of me and not just little parts of me. I want to practice being so honest that there's no way I can hide or withhold anything from my husband that I have in the future. And I feel like all of these experiences, even if that doesn't come true, even if that's not a reality for me in the future, I just wanna be an advocate for openness and honesty always. And if I'm not doing that in my own life, how in the world can I be somebody to talk to for somebody else? So I would say definitely just rounding me out as a, as a person so that I can contribute positively to a relationship in the future and also so that I can relate and help others that are going through the things that I went through as well. Yeah, and, and just listening to your story, it, it echoed mine in many circumstances and I, and I had the same desires too and I really do think um, those experiences for me, the grinder experiences, the hookup experiences, the, mm. the things that you clearly don't wanna tell your mom about, sorry mom if you're listening, um, <laughs> all those experiences, um, it really helped me do a, a number of things. And um, I think for me, the, the thing that was most beneficial was it helped me to help me personally understand what I was interested in. And mm. it helped me to better uh, see what I needed um, to be a happy, healthy, authentic, honest, fully functioning person. Absolutely. Not the person with all the labels no. that we just kind of went through, but really just a, a decent, functioning, um, giving, thriving beneficial person um, and having somebody by your side to help uh, accentuate and bring out those traits naturally. Mm. Those were all part, to mm. me, that's what a lot of those experiences did for me. Yeah. And as we talk about them, I hope that the audience doesn't look at these experiences and say, oh, but Brayden, that made, makes me think less of you. Oh. Or Kyle, that makes me think less of you that you experienced those because for me, those were the parts that helped me the very most mm. and set me on a, a path that, that really helped me live the fullest measure of my creation. Oh, gosh. I love that. I completely agree. Completely agree. So where do we go from here? You um, have borne your soul. You've been completely <laughs> candid and honest about um, your, uh, your experiences. But what does the future look like for Brayden? And, and how do we get there? Good question. I have no idea. I have no idea what my future looks like. My future that I, uh, my present that I'm living now 
looks nothing like I thought it would a year ago or two years ago. So uh, it's impossible for me to imagine what, I don't know, some sort of future will look like. I hope for certain things to happen. Um, but I don't know. I don't know what it looks like. I hope it, I hope that I continue to change and I hope I continue to learn and think differently about the world. I hope that wherever I am in the future, I look back on this interview and go, whoa, I feel differently about that because I, I value change and I value learning. And if one thing is certain, that's what I want to be certain is that I keep learning new information and I keep changing. I don't want people to look at these interviews five years down the road or even three years down the road and say, pull it, I'm not there anymore. Um, because I, I never want to gear these interviews that uh, constrict people to a message or a box. Mm, mm. Um, my hope is that people will share their story exactly where they're at today. Totally. And, and from there, I think that's why I, I really love opening um, or leaving open the end of these episodes to the future to say, it's okay to not know what the future looks like yeah. when really we are products, especially within Mormonism of the controller of our future. Uh, we do our best mm. work when we know what is ahead for us. And, yeah. and that's really something that Mormonism does effectively. It, it says, if you do this, this, and this, here are the guaranteed outcomes. Absolutely. And when those outcomes aren't realized, um, to me, that's where joy happens and that's where beauty and experience mm. and the, partaking of the fruit, um, that really is the beautiful part of the experience. I couldn't agree more. I, I could not agree more with that. I feel that I feel the way that I see life now, my behaviors may be different, and I feel like the most inner parts of me are still the same, but man, the beauty I find in this life on earth is greater than any other time that I've existed. And my intentions when I speak with people are so, I just feel pure. I feel like I just give them all of me. I'm not giving them a version of me. I'm not giving them a, a masked version of Brayden. When I speak with people now, they just get everything, which is so freeing. And it allows me to see all the beauty uh, and, and experience joy that is so deep, but also experience sorrow. Like the problems that I deal with now are not the problems that I used to deal with. Um, but the joys I've been able to feel are, are not the joys that I used to feel. So it's always um, a dichotomy between the two. I, I've thought of that too. And, and void in our experience today is this great Mormon expectation. And what we now have is opportunity. Mm. A and, and maybe that is the difference here. Is totally. when you live in a world of expectation where you're expected to do certain things and to perform certain ways. And I mean, spoiler alert, you, you've left the church. So there's there's some distance there. Unofficially and very still in a process. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I'm not saying like we write off your records and run away. I'm saying like um, the what for many people see as values and morals within mm. this framework of Mormonism, yeah. when we abandon those to borrow that phrase, live to the fullest measure of our creation. Mm -hmm. And then we thrive in that. Mm -hmm. um, I think that is a beautiful experience. Totally. And, and that is, is one of the greatest things that I hope more people experience. Me too. But the only way to experience it is by experiencing it. The only way to, live it as, or I will say seeing other people live it, right? Because we're, we're taught that if you are not in the church, you are experiencing a pseudo happiness, that you experience a measure of joy, but you don't actually experience the fullness of joy in this life if you are not a member of the church and if you're not obeying the commandments. That's literally in, in the scriptures. And so it takes people sharing their stories of how much they enjoy living and how beautiful they see the world outside of the parameters of the church, for sure. And I think the other beauty in this whole message is that I'm married. I married my husband um, early last year. The beauty in all of this for me, um, understanding Mormonism and uh, thriving above Mormonism in many aspects, mm. 
is that I personally didn't have to sacrifice any of my values or morals to get here. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that crazy? Because you're taught that you have to, but you didn't, and I think that's beautiful. And I think for so many who sit on the other side of this camera and share their stories, I don't recognize that they had to sacrifice their values or morals either. Totally. You, you just gain more, actually, in, in my opinion. You just learn more values and you, and you gain different values. Like, yeah. The way I treat people now is, I would say, I treat people better now in my life than I did when I was as active and as stalwart as you could be because I don't feel like they're on a different plane than I am. I feel like I am a human, they are a human, we're living on the earth together. I see them as just that. So I get to treat them just with the most purest intent. I'm not trying to get them to come to a sacrament meeting. I'm not trying to get them to come to an activity to meet with missionaries to then join the church. Uh, the way I treat people is so different now, but I would say better than I've ever treated them before. When people say, what does it look like to be authentic and honest? To me, mm. how you just responded is authenticity and honesty. Mm. That is what it's like to come out. That is what it's like to remove yourself from um, that fortress that you built, yeah. the walls that you created, the facade that you wanted the world to see you as. Ugh. When all of those are removed and when the world can see you exactly for who you are, that to me is honesty. That to me is authenticity. Mm. And that is where I hope more people land and find themselves in. Mm. That's why I think sharing stories uh, like this are so important. Brayden, um, what haven't we talked about that you wanted to talk about? Um, what oh my messages gosh. do you want the audience to, <laughs> to get from your story? I mean, so many, because that's all, all of that was like so spark noted, right? Like there's so many other little nuances and experiences um, that I could go into. <sighs> as far as my spirituality is concerned, I feel like, I mean, that in and of itself would take hours. So I don't want to delve into that. Um, I think maybe rewinding and going back to like testing and just how easy it is to get tested and, and being, being aware of those things because I feel like in Utah, the amount of, what what is another word for taboo? The amount of like secrecy or, or just, you know, things that we all hide. Nobody's getting tested. Like a lot, of, a lot of people, and I didn't for a long time when I was like hooking up with people, which is not safe because you, you can find yourself in a position where your life is altered for the rest of forever if you're not careful. And having conversations with people about being tested is, is a real thing that should happen. And um, if you're being sexually active, it, you don't have to go all in or nothing. You don't have to go into like fully penetrative sex in order to have a sexual experience with somebody. So there are many other things that you can do if you are still uncomfortable going and getting tested or, or wearing protection or getting on prep. Um, if you aren't comfortable with those things, then I would, I want to remind you that there's many other things you can do um, to have a sexual experience with somebody instead of putting yourself at risk to contract a, a, a virus that could alter things. Yeah, and I, I think this is a great opportunity to give a plug for a few you brought up here in Utah. Uh, probably one of the largest testing organizations in Utah is the Utah AIDS Foundation, um, which does test for free. So you are great. able a few days a week to enter to into the Utah AIDS Foundation location, and you can receive STI and AIDS uh, HIV testing um, for free. So that's uh, a service that they, they offer the community. Um, they're also, um, they provide um, condoms and um, resources and training that um, will also kind of help you navigate this world. I was recently speaking at an event and I had a mother come up to me who had a um, gay daughter and she said, mm. um, what, uh, how, do I, how do I open up a conversation about sexual health with my daughter? Question. Knowing that even like the mother doesn't understand of course, sex of course, and of course. how this all works. 
And I thought it was a really valid question. But the, the things that I find over and over and over again are primary care physicians. Um, your oh, PCP, yeah. um, your regular family doctor has uh, lots of resources. Mm, and totally. if, you, if you ask and they don't, find a, find a PCP that specializes in um, same gender care or um, uh, yeah, that's great. care that, that is familiar with this community. Because um, there are doctors out there who will help prescribe medications like PrEP, um, which are, are medications to help avoid um, HIV infection. Yeah, which I'm currently uh, in the process of. I just finished all my testing so that I could get on PrEP for the first time. Yeah, and so there, there are resources out there and available by just asking. And so if you are navigating this world unsure of, of how to get there, um, I would recommend here in Utah, the Utah AIDS Foundation, uh, mm -hmm. plan Planned Parenthood has... Yeah, Planned Parenthood is great. That's the, that was the first place that I went to just because I, like, Googled you know, STI testing, uh, and that was the one that I went to for the first few times. It's great. Uh, locally, the Salt Lake County Health Department offers um, mm. uh, these services as well, and you'll find these services available at your local health departments, so even if you're outside of the beehive bubble. Um, these do exist in community health uh, areas. Uh, again, yeah, I think it, this, is, this is something that we don't understand, and I didn't either. In fact, same, same. Uh, yeah, before I was even sexually active, um, I had started dating a guy and he said, oh, we're both going to get tested before we do anything. And mm. I was like, whoa, like, <laughs> OK, how does this even happen? And, and I do remember like awkwardly walking into the uh, Utah AIDS oh, Foundation. Yeah. You guys, it's awkward. Sure. It, you just got to get over it at some point. Yeah, yeah. You didn't. I didn't want to like make eye contact with anybody. Of I didn't course. want anybody to recognize yes. me. Yes. A and like, here's new boyfriend in tow. Like, it was all awkward. Of course. But they also sat us down and like gave us some really good education. Amazing. And I learned things I didn't know before. And there was even some peace of mind knowing that I just went through all this testing and everything was negative. Like, totally. And for me, that was like monumental there was yeah. something really great about that yeah and then we had discussions about prep we had discussions about prophylactics and we had discussions mm. about all these different things that f for my whole mormon upbringing was just super taboo of course and where i couldn't sit at, at a kitchen table with my mother and or father and have these conversations so where else would i would have would i find them and to your point earlier in this episode most don't have resources to no, find them no. and we end up getting ourselves into big problems yes and yes. lifelong um, sticky opportunities or sticky situations because of a lack of education absolutely so I do appreciate you bringing it up and, and of course at least having a two-minute conversation about testing yeah and I obviously I'm not I'm no doctor I'm just talking about my lived experience with and the lived experience of so many people that I've talked to and had experiences with and like prep, for example, I there's a website called um, I think it's called Hey Mister, M I S T R, um, and that's how I uh, looked up the prep. Everything, everything was free, 100% free, and it's the easiest thing. They schedule all the appointments for you. They tell you where you can go to do the testing. It's so simple. It's like a urine sample and and blood work, just like a little bit, um, and it's all free. And it's just like a, a resource that I had no idea about. But when I went and got tested, I finally was just like, will you explain PrEP to me? Like, will you talk to me about that? Because I'm just interested. And again, another dis disclaimer. I, hearing these conversations, somebody could think, oh, these people are just like going out and having sex all the time. And they're, that's not it at all. That's not it at all. Um, but if you are choosing to go and have sexual experiences, you might as well protect yourself. And that's a conversation I've had to have in my own brain to be like, okay, because you're getting on prep does not mean that you should just go out and go crazy with everybody at all. It's more of just if you find yourself in a position where you want to have an experience with somebody, you will have the peace of mind knowing that you are safer than not protecting yourself. So I think sometimes it's either, again, it goes back to the black and white thinking of being raised in a very religious um, community. If you're talking about sexual testing or, or experiences, that doesn't mean somebody is out there going crazy all day, every day, not at all. Um, and I wanna kind of break that stereotype as well. 
so that kids feel comfortable talking about it. And it's okay. And taking those necessary steps yes. for their health. Yeah. As if we were to take vitamins and uh, eat a healthy meal in order to stay healthy. Of course. I, I think these are other methods and, and uh, opportunities to also uh, remain in good health. Totally. In good standing. Totally. And I also just want to point out that this isn't just a uh, homosexuality discussion either. Um, for for our you. straight audience Thank as you. well, they absolutely could benefit from PrEP and Truvada and, and other true. opportunities out there. Very true. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. All right, Brayden. We're wrapping the podcast. Okay. What, uh, what do you want to leave the audience with? What should they know? Ultimately, what do you want the audience to get out of your story? Sounds cliche, but the experiences that people have are so common. They are so common. You are absolutely not alone in, in the, your frustrations and your loneliness and your the head games that you play with yourself about how worthy or unworthy or righteous or unrighteous you are. Every We all go through it. And... So you're definitely not alone. No matter how s strange or different you think your experience is, somebody else has experienced it. I, like, I know that based off of my experience. I've never met one person that's like, that's weird. I've never heard of that before. Everybody usually shares the same thing. So if, you, if somebody do does feel alone or is listening to this, just hoping for the day that things that they can live more authentically or more honestly. Um, it's very real. It's a very real reality. I just came out last January on social media and started dating men two years ago. That's it, two years ago. And my life is so different. It ha it's not this like 10 year process of me trying to date and all of this. This is all happening in two years. So if you think that your story Just be, it's, oh, it'll happen. It'll happen. You will find authenticity. You will find honesty at some point, and it'll probably come quicker than you think is possible. So, Amen to that. I was just, as you brought up that timeline, I thought five, maybe six years ago, I was married to my wife and living totally. in a seemingly white picket Mormon totally. fence world. And um, now I'm married to a guy, divorced amicably, um, I mm. host a podcast. I'm involved in a lot of these circles. And yes, I, I was the person who said, I'm never coming out. I'm closeted <sighs> for the rest of my life. And boy, how time changes us so quickly. So quickly. That's beautiful. I, I've loved um, getting to watch your journey from like just being on social media because this is the first time we've met. That's right. So, And I feel like I know you, um, even though we've never like spoken before, but... That's really, I didn't realize that it was also such a short timeline that everything has changed in your life. And I think that's a good point to even those who are um, older who say it's not worth coming out. I'm too old. Mm -hmm. I won't find love. I'm, uh, I'm just beyond, um, time has passed. I'm just beyond mm -hmm. that point where I could ever uh, fully appreciate who and what I am. Mm -hmm. And I always say, no way. Uh, some dear friends of mine come out have come out in their 70s and still lived that that beautiful version of life that they had missed for so many decades mm, i love that and uh is there ever the perfect or right time to come out i don't know but come out mm. and live uh life authentically yeah. And embrace that level of honesty that you deserve and your friends and family deserve. Absolutely. And I, and I promise you, life does get better. It does. It does. You'll still have problems. They may be different problems, but internally you will feel peaceful, more peaceful. Yeah. And when, and we, can do, when we can do that, shedding all of that fake stuff that we created, how can we not take that opportunity to live uh, honestly and give the world a... Uh, a beautiful view of who we are. To me, I just think that's honest, and I think that's right, mm. and I think that is a benefit for all of us. Can I share one more thing? Absolutely. Just a thought. I because we didn't we haven't touched much on kind of 
where I'm at spiritually, and I feel like this is a little important. It wasn't, so I've recently just kind of decided to step away from the church. Um, I would say as of like March, April of this year, so it's been quite a few months, but that decision came by not a lack of trying. And I just want to make that very clear that all day, every day, that was my purpose is to look at the church and go, okay, I don't fit in the church being gay, but I'm going to etch out a place in the church for myself. And I was dedicated. I woke up every day ready to study the scriptures, to, to, to read deep into the doctrines, like I was studying about the, um, the law of adoption in the early church, and I was like, okay, I could marry a man through, like, they could maybe bring back the law of adoption, and I could be adopted to a man in the temple. You know, like, my brain just tried to etch out a spot for me in the church, and I tried, and I was so hopeful that it would work, and I just had to, once again, be very honest with myself and come to the conclusion that doctrinally speaking, in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, there is not a place for homosexual children of God. Doctrinally speaking. I'm not talking about culture. I'm not talking about, yeah, come sit with us on Sunday. My ward is great. My bishop's great. Like, please, those are all wonderful things. But doctrinally speaking, it doesn't exist. Hasn't exist. And from what we're being told and taught, it's not going to exist. I was hopeful that the brethren would bring up some change or something to make my life easier inside of the church. But it never happened. And I can't live my life hoping for something that's not reality. I can't live my life hoping that the brethren will change their mind and that they will let me marry a man in the church. I, I can't live like that. That's, that's living on a false reality that doesn't exist and may never exist. And so I just realized that in order to live my life truthfully and honestly, I had to accept that personally and go, okay. I tried for decades to stay and to make a spot for me, but in the doctrines of the church, it doesn't exist. And that is why I've chosen to find spirituality and find love and find God and Christ um, elsewhere where I can fit and have a positive experience. I look forward to seeing where your journey takes you. I've thank been you. excited to see it thus far. Thank you. Braden, thank you. Thank you for giving us uh, an opportunity to uh, peer behind the curtain a little bit and, and get a very candid and honest look into your experience. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Truly, it's been a blessing, really. Yeah, I'm, I'm grateful for, for people who share their stories uh, in a very honest and candid way that allows each of us an opportunity to better understand this experience. And so just thank you. Thank you for giving us uh, and our audience, a, I think, a feast and so much to glean from your experience. <laughs> I hope. I hope. Thank you. Thank Th you for having me. Thank you for thank you for uh, experiencing your whore phase for us. So. Oh no, <laughs> we got to come up with a different way to say that. <laughs> yeah, like the the sexual awakening phase. Oh, I like the awakening phase. I like it. Maybe just so we don't add to the. We're gonna the coin whole. it. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> um, again, <laughs> Braden, thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's experiences like this that help us to uh, better understand the LGBTQ uh, journey that so many of us travel. So again, I want to thank Braden for giving us an hour or a few extra minutes on top of that hour of his time. And for yours as well. Thank you for uh, joining us on this episode of Latter-day Stories. Uh, again, we talked about this in the beginning of the episode. To help us the very best way, please share this episode. Um, invite others who are in... Um, 
this periphery in this sphere to listen to the latter day stories podcast to use it as a resource to better understand these experiences um, as tools and resources to help others navigate if you are watching on a video version of this uh, episode we invite you to share your comments um, there are uh, opportunities to share your feelings about this episode, ask Braden questions on the video versions on our YouTube and Facebook versions. So we invite you to do that now. Uh, you can find the chat feature or the comment feature. Or if you are listening to an audio version of this podcast, wherever you catch your favorite audio podcasts, we invite you to not only subscribe uh, and like uh, this episode uh, by subscribing to the channel and liking the episodes like this, but also sharing it on social media helps us to expand our reach. And we invite you to do that. We always say those who listen to the audio version, if you are subscribed uh, to the podcast version through Apple or Google or Spotify, or even now uh, Amazon has picked us up in the Amazon podcast series, um, you will get these episodes just a little bit sooner than the video version. So that's kind of a perk to listening on the audio side. Again, we thank you for giving us uh, your time and a few minutes of your life to better understand this experience. It's stories like mine, it's stories like Braden's, and it's stories like yours that help us each to continue writing our own latter gay story.